so we are slightly uh, shifting uh, field. Is this right one? Yes. So we are talking about now. Now it may somehow is related because it's actually we are doing we are talking about phylogeny, which is a way to do clustering. But we will also I will talk a bit more again about evolution and about genomics a little bit like that. But um, so it's uh, it's it's going for the multiple six alignments to actually probably what has been the most exciting results from the human genome project. So basically, why, why we can sequence so much now? So really, what we wanted to solve to cure a lot of people a lot of diseases. And I'm sure it helped in some cases, but the number of life that are saved by the human genome project is probably quite low still. And there are a few genes that have been discovered that are important, but but certainly we have learned a lot about evolution. A lot about biology in general, also, but, but particularly from an evolution point. So I will talk a little bit about uh, general, about uh, genomics and so on, and we will particularly focus on phylogeny, so the methods to classify how sequences are related to each other. And this is the, con it will be much more about this in the course comparative genomics. That is, I think, uh, after Easter, more or less. Mm -hmm. or, uh, not, not next course, but the one after that. But, uh, but so phylogeny is an important field of bioinformatics. And of course, the reason is, of course, why we are here and why we do bioinformatics is this, that we all heard about the sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper so like today it was as I said over the first lecture it's much cheaper to sequence an organism than to do anything else with it particularly if it's bacteria and uh, well we all there's been a lot, a lot of talk about the thousand dollar genome and we are there more or less so today so the cost of a human genome sequence is in, is in the order of one thousand dollars so it's quite cheap and uh, it would not be that if you want to have a new organism sequence from scratch, but if basically from the human genome it's down to their cost. It slightly depends on how much you can get the investment cost, but there are a number of new techniques that are going to be significantly cheaper again. So, so the people always shoot it on graphs. It's the cost of sequencing, but you also have the graph that how many sequences are in the database and it goes the other way, like experiments after that. And you can compare it to anything else, like... Uh, uh, even the computers that are getting faster and faster and cost the computers is this kind of drop here is hardly ever seen in any other development in anything in the world. I think the only exception is if you look at the number of web pages that they've all developed in the first year of the World Wide Web because we got, went from zero to millions quite fast. But that's like the only really exponential thing that we close to this in speed. But you see it also seems to have dropped out there somewhere. You won't get down to one dollar probably. It's going to, well, if you continue this speed, you will be down to one dollar or this year. But somehow, even <laughs> taking the blood test will cost more than one dollar. What is it today? It's just another thousand dollars. I haven't. I remember last year. I think that the Asylum Lab we do it for thousand dollars. I think it's actually probably the age so the Lumina X by whatever it's called. Uh, I think they are. Mm -hmm. A chemical cost in the order of two thousand dollars. Yeah. It was last year, enough. but then you have this kind of this Oxford nanopores and these other single sequence there. I don't know really how reliable and how fast they are, but they're cheap. So it, it's and then probably the Lumina dropped the price also. So it's, I think it's the in the order of thousand dollars today. And then that's the raging costs. Machines are not super expensive, but but if you if you run it because there are many you can run so much of them, and uh, and it takes. A day or something like that on the machine or something like that. So, it, so really the bottleneck is often actually the analysis what, what you do with it. I mean, you have the genome and I mean, it's actually thousand dollars is a week of work for one person. So if you may ask the uh, people doing the analysis, it's significantly more expensive than uh, than uh, the, the sequencing. Yeah, you need robots. I mean, it's a lot of things can be automatic, but yeah. We have robots, so we have... No, but I mean, if you really want to do something about it, this is often the actual bottleneck. So the, the, I mean, if you send your hair or whatever, or, or saliva to 23andMe or something like that, so you get like a list of possible diseases. Well, they're not so much, but possible 
things can find in your genome. These are, these are of course automatically generated. They, they, don't, they don't do the full genome sequencing, they have to look for some particular mutations. And I think most people actually what they're interested in is, at least Americans are always interested in the ancestry, they find that there are one quarter Italians and two, two thirds uh, Afghan and then one third black Americans or something. So they, that, that's what they obviously seems to be the most interesting find. So, so we actually maybe we should talk about a bit about what the genome is. So we know that genomes are on the front line. Or used to be on the front line uh, on newspapers. Nobody cares anymore. So nobody gets the, gets the nature of cover for a new genome. Well, you got it for the Neanderthal genome, but that's like the last one, I think. Maybe if you find a dinosaur genome, you can you can get another on the front page. Yeah. I think the mammoth. I doubt it. But some of the human things you got. But so basically, we also have. Uh, uh, we know the genome is one thing that also obvious from uh, the genome projects is that uh, well we have all the nucleotides but we also have other DNA in <coughs> the eukaryotic cells we have DNA in the mitochondria and in uh, uh, in uh, the um, mm. chloroplast in plants and in vectors in uh, bacteria. So why should we study genomes? One of the obvious, my little question now is, is to cheap, so we don't care about it anymore. But, but, but in the beginning, it was about why it's expensive to sequence the whole genome. And it's only in the human genome, it's only like a small fraction, a few percentage that is actually called a protein. So why should we study the whole thing? Or why should we spend a lot of millions of dollars of, of sequencing it? And actually, one interesting good thing is that we actually have really complete sets or something. So really, we know what is there, but we also know what is not there. Which is, at least in, uh, uh, which, is, which is kind of unique in, in some scientific point of view. Like we know really what we have, but we also know what we don't have. So if it is a function that we can't find, uh, I can't explain, either it's something we don't understand, or it's actually not there in, in an organism, particularly bacteria. And of course, we can make a list. We can, we can basically go through every gene and knock them out by one, one by one and see what happens. That's what we've done in Jesus and E. coli and wild mouse. You can, you, can see, you can take every gene and study them one by one. You can put a network, as in the systems biology things. We can really put a network of all the genes and how they're interacting. So we can, look, we can study uh, the DNA regulation. We can study what is the binding site and transcription factor in front of every gene. So what, if you know a transcription factor, we can, we can go through computation. Where does it bind? Because that's basically just the nuclear sequence. Then, of course, every no single genome is ever completely complete, except maybe some small bacterial genome. Because it's always going to be some parts that are going to be hard to sequence. So some repetitive parts or the telomeres, etc. And there's also variation between people that is important. So, and, but anyway, we started genome. Actually, the first genome was probably published in 1978. This was a virus. And in the 80s, we get to the mitochondria. So mitochondria is, 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 was used a long time for studies of uh, uh, evolution, because you can compare mitochondria between humans. They're not identical. You can compare. So it is a very good. And there are a couple of reasons. I mean, one is because it is small, it's only 60,000 bases, 60, bases. It's very small. The other thing is actually that we have many copies of it. We have more than one copies per cell. We can maybe have about a thousand copies per cell. So if you want to extract it from some small sample, it's about a thousand times easier. So we have a thousand times more of it. And there's enough variation in mitochondria you can separate different uh, human, well, not about every individual, but you can separate humans. And they can read this right, to large extent. And then a bit sequencing happening a bit not so fast, but you got got some bigger viruses. They have some bar viruses, quite big. And then the genome probably started in the middle 90s or early 90s. The first thing you started doing was actually taking one chromosome from yeast. Why well, a couple of chromosomes? I think I guess chromosome three was maybe the smallest one. I don't know why, but. That was 300,000 kilobases. And in those days, you really did the sequencing. You divided this into part, small parts, and you took it into a bacterial vector and put it there, and you sequenced small parts of it at a time. So you really had, it was a lot of work. So you really had to put it in and clone it into a bacteria. 
and everything equals it. While from on somewhere here, from C elegance and so on, you basically use maybe maybe even E cool, I don't think equal uh, uh, you, you did what's called shotgun sequencing. So you really just took your genome and you basically used radiation or something to make it into small fragments and you sequence each fragment. And you just purify the fragments. They were about the same size. So in 2001, the Human Genome Project was fi finished, or at least reported for the first time. It was sort of three, gigab three gigabases. In 2008, the first individual genome was the first genome was actually not an individual; it was a mix of three or four people. And then actually 2008 it was it was almost the first individual genome sequenced. And. Uh, in actually 2009, we published Neanderthal genomes, one of the first extinct genomes. <coughs> so today we had first we had the thousand thousand genome projects, which was published three years ago, and now in Sweden we have a project of fifteen thousand genomes. And I think in England we have hundred fifty thousand. I think in China we have about a million people that want to sequence. So you really, it's not going to be unlikely basically basic of my secret. Everyone on Earth, but it's a large fraction of people on Earth going to be able to sequence. <coughs> Sometimes like some. So really, do, wh wh why would you do it? So, honestly, it's not that useful for most people. I mean, you basically, well, you, what you can do from, from a genome sequence, you can, you can guess that you have certain risks getting a couple of some diseases, more or less. I mean, there are a few ones are important, but, but most likely you, your guess is not much better than uh, uh, looking at what diseases your parents or grandparents got. So if you know if you have four, three grandparents dead, dead in cancer, you probably should be able to do cancer screening. And that's more or less what you probably can say for the genome. If they all died in car accidents, maybe that, I don't know what you would do for that, but that probably the genome might have tell you as much anyhow. So they are, but there, there are particularly few neonatal diseases that are where you actually really can do something and prevent it very early. But, but metabolic diseases, you have, you, you're lacking an enzyme for making something. And you don't die from it, but uh, brain development or something is severely disturbed. So if you and also you can treat them by eating the right food or something or, or, or some kind of supplements. So these are a few things where really gene sequencing can help, but they are quite rare. But it, they are things, and there are of course a few gene not, genes that are detected, like uh, the BRCA genes for breast cancer that are really that you really are good to know. If you have it, you should be extremely careful. Check your breasts and your virus. Okay, so this genus looks like that. They are huge variation of sizes, in particular plants uh, can be very big and very small. No, not very small, but very big or something. But in general, there's a trend that viruses and bacteria and single cell organisms are smaller and then the multicellular organisms are bigger. But it's not really a trend of uh, uh, having mammals or more complex an animals being bigger than other animals and plants that are at least in many aspects are, are less complex than uh, animals because they have different cell, fewer cell types etc etc have some of them have very very big genomes and that's often because of whole genome duplications we basically have the same genome we duplicate many times or so basically have copies of the same thing again like everything exists two or four or ten to times but it also there are of repetitive elements, there are small parts of the genome that's copied many, many, many times. So of course, you always try to find the genomes that were down at the bottom here, because they were easy to sequence. But today, or a few years ago, this is how it looked like. So we had a few thousand, uh, well, 10,000 projects, I haven't had a number, but it's much bigger today. So, uh, So uh, a few genomes that are, that are most like just in introduction are like the uh, bacteria has in the order of a few million base pairs and a few thousand genes. 
Yeast has on the other hand maybe three or four times more nucleotides and slightly more genes. While the human genome has uh, almost a thousand times more nucleotides and maybe five times more genes. So really, uh, there are a lot of difference on uh, between different genes here. Do you have uh, so big, big organisms have com more complex genes, and other genes have uh, other pro uh, proteins have, but al but also more complex genes and more complicated genomes. So you know that. In humans, we have a lot of exons, and uh, well, in bacteria, you do not have it. So, how can we compare these things to each other? This is what we do in using uh, trees. So, if you want to take a gene like that, so you want to take genes from different organisms and you want to compare them, see how they relate to each other. And this is uh, what people call phylogeny. So the phylogeny is from the Greek word uh, group, and how uh, and how so how things are grouped through these sets. This is a tree of life somehow, not that easy to say. But there are two types of trees. You can see this is a tree. This is also also a tree. So they they, they really represent different things. Uh, but they are all somehow re re both of them are. Uh, this one has clearly a common ancestor and has kind of a timeline you can think about. You start here and you end up here. Well, this actually just describes the relationship of what we see today. So this is what's called a rotor tree, and this other one is called an unrotor tree. So the, 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 but actually, this is often the data you have, because often you don't know the ancestral sequences. You often just know what you have today. So really, you don't know how this one up here looks like. You don't know what this part over here look like. So this is actually the data you have. And then you have to decide often what was the root, what was the common ancestor. What was, so often you will guess it was probably somewhere here. So there's this kind of finches. That group of finches are different from this group of finches. Like that. But you can do these trees in different ways. Um, so this is a tree of different types of birds. You have the yellow birds and the brown birds. And you have different legs. And different beaks, and you, get, you 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 would just assume that these two yellow birds are more similar because they're yellow, and these brown birds are more similar to each other because they are brown. But you also would say that somehow uh, uh, you want to calculate uh, that they are all uh, uh, that this difference maybe is bigger than that difference or something like that. So you, somehow you would like this length here to to, to represent um, the difference, the distance between the, the two different species, or two different genes. So you could have a tree that looks like that. So if you say that this one is, is actually some measure of difference in the number of mutations, for instance. And so this is three, and this is six. So we mean nine mutations between these two. And then there will be some common answers there with three up the road and four and five here. So between that one and that one will be three, six, ten, eleven mutations. So it's like the edit distance? Yeah. You, you, ideally, the, the perfect tree would be that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always offer. You could, it's not guaranteed that you can find it. That's the problem. And of course, ideally, of course, you would like to have something that represents time. Of course, you know, this all live today. So ideally, you would like to have if the, if the, every. This thing I would represent the distance of time. So you, you can say this happened two million years ago, but of course that assumes that the mutation rate, or whatever you measure here, in, is equal all the time. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. So often, of course, often you, you often you, pre, you write a tree like that, but actually the data supports it to go to that instead, because for some reason there happened fewer mutations here than it did. In this one here, at the same time. So, and often, so of course, what we have in in, in, in genomics is that we have uh, species trees and gene trees. So we often have, we know the species. We know that the uh, human and chicken are more closely 
it has in the the, the frog and the, and the worm and etc. So there are some kind. We know this relationship from basically from whatever study you want to do with evolutionary or uh, from um, uh, from just looking at the uh, Linnaeus type of studies or whatever. But we can basically uh, split it. But then if you, it doesn't mean that the genes are always happen. Particularly, we might have several genes that are related in the same organism. So in this case, we have three human genes and three chicken genes. It's actually so that human one and chicken one are more are more similar to each other than than human two and chicken. Uh, then they're in the, either they are to human two or chicken two. So that indicates that in this case, in the common answer of human and chicken, all these three genes were present. Because if otherwise, if they have evolved after the split of human and chickens, the human ones would should be more similar to each other, and there should be the chicken ones. So, yeah, so all of these kind of trees here represent some kind of splits. So really are, they represent when the species split or when the gene split, when did it duplicate. So we know for species basically split when they don't interbreed any longer. So there are population groups that are split. So from all Darwin studies, of course, we know that there can be finches living in two different islands. They're too far away from each other, and you can't. Then they are, even if they're very similar, just by time have averaging, they're gonna split into different species. And uh, develop slightly different, um, uh, slightly different uh, features, and also slightly different genomes. So. You want to find a tree here, so you want to see what, what is the common split. So you see, sea lions and seals are more similar to each other, and then a split between these two, two, two different species that happened after they split away from the raccoons and dogs and the bears. And then um, you have some features that are somehow do that. So you have this X here. And actually, but it, you never, if you do a genome, you, you, you have some algorithms, we'll talk about later, that calculate these trees. So also, you do not always certain if the split is correct. So you basically you, you generate maybe a hundred different trees with slightly different parts of the genome or parts of the gene and you see how often do I observe the split. So in this case we'd observe 100% of the cases we see sea lion seal split. But these so that that's quite a certain case so these are coupled together. But here's much less certain because sometimes the raccoon end up next to the dog and sometimes the bear end up separate and so on. So this this is the most common one but you only find it in half of the trees. So you have what you call a bootstrap value, basically it's a confidence. So that's, it's important when you look at the tree that you somehow know how reliable it is. So you could basically, you could condense this tree to maybe something like that. You don't know how these are separated. But you have that these are, this resell is outside, you have at least 75% bootstrap value to support. And the cat is further, the monkey is far, are further away. So back to this uh, th tree here. So we say that genes can either be related by a species split or a gene, of du gene duplication. So basically you have two copies of the same gene in the same, same genome. And these are defined as uh, orthologs and paradox. So basically orthologs are genes that are separated by speciation events. So basically they are the same gene in the two, two, one genome and then these two that organism split into two different organisms. So there happens to be a volcano and you end up on the east and the west side of the volcano and you never see each other again. And then you have wait a million years and then you're gonna have two different animals living one, one side of the volcano and then you're gonna have the same gene there and they're, they're gonna be autologs. On the other hand, if you have a paralog, that means that in the same organism this is a gene, gene duplication. So something happens in the duplication. So you have two, two copies of the gene, and then they can, and they, they survive, and they take over and stay in the population, and you end up with uh, uh, two copies of the gene. But of course, during evolution, these two copies are going to evolve and do slightly different things. And the, the idea, which is 
not extremely strongly supported by, by experiments, but the idea is at least that if you took a copy of gene, one of them would be favored, be free to move to explore new functions. So the idea is that if you have, or, if you have one copy of it and logs, they should be doing the same thing, but if they are parallel to the copies of the same thing, they do, they kind of free to, to, to that, that more of, uh, allowed to be doing more things. So, so that allows new, new functions to arrive. Some uh, other examples of when you have, you have sub functionalizations, you have maybe have one gene that is functional in there, and then one part of the body, another part of another body, something that you can have more specialized functions. So, as you notice, we have basically orthologs and paralogs. Homologs is a common word that can use everything, does it just have a common ancestor? And then, of course, you have some cases you have similar functions that are similar sequences that do not have a common ancestor called similar logs or something like that. So basically this is a description of the genome gene evolution. So you can have a duplication from alpha gene to two alpha genes. And then, uh, then the, these two genes become slightly different. Something happens to them. So the beta alpha is one of them is evolving into beta. So it does something slightly different. And then there's a speciation. So you have an, in this species A, you have alpha and beta, and they stay like that. You have to keep on changing a bit. But in this one, maybe you have uh, uh, this one is duplicated, and one of them evolves a new function. So you, this one you have X3 comp. Three, three different uh, genes. So, so then, then it means that um, these are all paralogs in the gene. They're all, all common paralogs. They all relate to each other. And this is also paralogs. But the ortholog of alpha here is basically uh, all these alphas here and the gamma also actually. So if you look at three, how similar they are to each other, most likely we will look at that. <coughs> The beta genes of the two different species will be more similar to each other, than, but all the alpha genes will be more similar to each other. The most similar ones will be the gamma, B alpha, and B gamma. So these two will be most similar because that was the shortest time since they, they the adapted. <coughs> so it's been quite a lot of work of finding this relationship between different genomes. Genes are, can, ha, if I have a tree here, can I find how this has happened in history? And particularly, the reason is when you find these applications are often or can be explaining new functions, and you can explain what is which genes are more closely related, etc. So I'm sure that uh, uh, Eric Sonham will talk more about it later. So uh, basically, if you have some globin gene here, you have an alpha beta chain, and then hemoglobin alpha beta, and then this evolved a long time ago, but now both in, both in mouse, chicken, frog, you have one copy of each of these. So these are autologs, and these are paralogs between them in the mouse alpha mouse beta, and these are autologs. So you detect this, it's, it's not so hard to detect it, but it can be difficult because it's not noise, but in principle, you just do pairwise clustering. So you find autologs, you're finding things that are uh, next to each other. So if, if you have a gene in species A, if it's close to neighbor in C, also it's close to neighbor in A. There's, they are or they are likely to be orthologs. But uh, the clustering process will only give us the like groups, right? Then we will either have to manually figure out in which order they came, or is there well, there are algorithms. People, so basically, what you do in the, in this way is. You check the difference. The problem, the problem is, yeah, basically what you do is that you have a species tree. So you know what the species tree looks like. Often that's the way. And then you try to maximize what's most likely pattern in the species tree. <coughs> so there are quite low, we will come back, you know, not to that, but there are methods to estimate it. They are probably that the, the good methods that use MCMC are very time consuming. And uh, you really have to be careful. And particularly our problems also, for instance, one problem is genome is gene loss. But it's not only that you duplicate gene, you also lose genes. So, uh, so often, of course, a common problem is that we, of course, 
we want to find species trees, we want to find a relationship between different species, this is like, an, or, I mean, we want to know if we are more similar to chimpanzees or, or gorillas, or uh, how different animals are related. This is a common a tree, we want to find that, and of course, if you have, if you only had one crop, if you take one gene that exists all the way in every genome and evolved equally fast, it would be quite easy, but that is not happening. No, same in particular, you can have uh, a genome, so you have four different uh, species, and you have two genes in each, and for instance, if you have the, if this is the species tree, but then the genes are lost, and in particular, if in one of these A and B, lost alpha, another one lost beta. Then you would get, instead of having this tree that you look at that, with two small things like that, you would actually end up with a tree that looks somehow like that, the beta will be more related, B will be more related to C and D, and alpha will be separated. So if you lost them, you would have put the wrong things next to each other. So you want to, so, so this, the genomes are, uh, Doing both, I mean, the duplication losses are makes these things not super simple. So, but ideally, so back to this example again, you want to have this ones, and you have these duplication things here. You could, you could try to find three that you put together like that, and you try to do both things at the same time. You try to put both the, the, the species tree and the other tree. So, basically, you have this Senopos and Catostomus that in this case should be more similar to the human one and she can one. So you had here was a duplication of these two, and here was a species strip between this another duplication happening down here. So you try to combine minimizing the number of duplications and losses and still having a tree that fits with the species tree. So you basically have here you would end up with a tree that have three duplication events from this tree that uh, sorry from this tree. This is species tree, you have the xenon tree that you see, you have the xenopos and catosmos are similar to that one, and you have two artemia genes that are, that are similar, and the sort lies on the one copy of. So it's, if you want to get a reconciled tree, you have to do this is what you're doing with intermediate, and you end up here with one application there and one application there, and then also loss, I guess, in one intrasophila. Also remember, oh, I uh, right, we can also remember that all similarities we see are not homologs. So if you take these three residues from a serine protease, they look very similar. They look like this, look the same. But if you look at the whole protein structures, they look like that, completely dissimilar. So this is just because this is the catalytic site are identical, but the protein looks completely different and the evolution of this protein are completely unrelated. Uh, but anyway, if you take this and you take them three genes, three, three genomes, uh, human, chicken and uh, fish, and you can see that there are about say, six, seven thousand, or maybe up to ten thousand genes that are really exist in more than one copy in each of these, and they are really all close next to each other. So they really have a core set of pro proteins that are identical. Then you have a few that exist in more multiple copies, and then you have things that are more common in one of the genomes and another, another, and then you have a lot of, also a subset that is unique to each genome. So really about half, more or less, of the human genome is basically, has clearly similar proteins, similar genes in all other animals. And maybe some uh, hundred or some, or so, well, a few thousands, even of the you know, genes are unique to the primates. But most, of a very large set are somehow related, but they've been duplicated in different ways, combined in different ways. And there's one more thing that complicates the story, in particular in bacteria, is that actually you have horizontal, horizontal gene, gene transfer. So if you want to study bacterial genomes, you want to see how they are related, and you take a gene, it's not that easy because there are many examples of genes that are not following the bacteria but are transferred to other bacteria, not by, by 
by the direct uh, core genome, but actually by small plasmids or other fragments that are more definitive. In particular, examples we look at all the res res resistance genes that are found in um, bacteria now, you have, uh, that, that, that are uh, probably in the hospital. Then you have, uh, uh, these are of course transfer between very unrelated bacteria. So they are, but they are, and they are most of them are in plasmids, but not all of them. And then of course, really, this doesn't mean that these bacteria are very closely related just because they, have, they share these identical genes, basically. So it has been a selective advantage to pick them up. Is this the same thing as lateral gene transfer? Yeah, this is another word. And it, it has been a lot of discussions about um, if there's been transfer of bacterial genome to humans, is that something that, and it's, the, there are a number of statistics, obviously. If you do some, if you do an analysis in the wrong way, you probably, you see it, but it's, the evidence is quite low. And of course, we know if some cases, when I mean, you have retroviruses, HIV, that somehow, of course, HIV is somehow inserted into the human genome, but most people, HIV is not transferring it, because it's not in the, in, in the well, it's, on, it's only in the blood cells, not in, in the germ cells. But so the retrovirus could be used to transfer between species. So some of these repeated elements are believed to be retroviruses to start with from the, the stuff that it's like a new one. So really, yeah, if you want to do this, you have to be, if you want to study the evolution, you need to take in these things into account. So bacterial ancestry is very, very difficult because of that reason. But anyway, uh, I guess we should actually make a small short break, maybe, mm, and then we can go back to, well, let's go a few more slides first. So like, let's do a, a few uh, basic, basic things about evolution. It's like, this is really what you have for, from Darwin. We know that we have selection. So basically, a random, I mean, the whole idea is that mutations are happening randomly. So there's some kind of mutational, happens randomly. It's not completely true that it's completely random over all the genome. There are probably pre preferences for some regions and other regions, but more or less random. Uh, and then you have some kind of selections. Basically, if the mutation makes the organism unhappy, you're going to have less children and you're going to be... Uh, that mutation is going to disappear. So you have a selection. And of course, somehow you have an idea that in general, if you don't change the amino acid sequences, you're not very likely to uh, have a mutation. I mean, you're not like to have a strong selective pressure. So you, have, you, can, you can even calculate the, the changes that change the amino acids, not amino acids. It's not all completely true, because certainly the nucleotides matter also to some part. There are also cases, of course, if you need, if, if there's this change of environment, you might need to have fast evolution, you might have a positive selection, you really want to change some genes because there really is a need for rapid evolution. And then you talk about positive selection, you really have something that changes amino acid sequences more than expected by random. Uh, so you can talk about, you talk about two types of mutations, synonymous and non-synonymous. So synonymous ones change, do not change the amino acid sequences. Non-synonymous change the amino acid sequences. You have change the codon. But also you, you know that we have gaps from the alignments. And that's no really good models of evolution that introduce gaps, but they happen. We had these gene duplications, the genes that duplicate. But we also have things like gene fusion and gene splits. There are cases, many cases where you have two genes that are fused together. And then there are going a longer gene. And uh, a horizontal transfer I talked about. So the mutations, are, so it's, it's it's not only point mutation. There are more complicated things that we need to take into account. So I guess this is next question. Just we talk of, of the break. Is talk of how to make these trees. So we talk about but quickly about a uh, couple of different methods, how to make a dream. But I, I think I need um, to say, uh, I did, let, give us five minutes for coffee? Five. Yeah. Ten. Okay. <laughs>
Or? Yeah. Ten, ten, okay. So it's had to be back, uh, slightly mm-hmm. before half, at least. So, so now I'll just stick three at the same time, so there's a few. Yeah, so let's, ten, let's, try, let's try to make it in ten. Yeah. 